Hey church, we are so excited for service today and we hope that you had a wonderful and fantastic Christmas as we all have. We hope that you either got cuddled up by a fire or it may be even just an image of one on your television screen. Hey, well, we've got an amazing service planned for you. And if this is your first time with us or maybe you've been with us before, we just wanna connect with you. So just, just click the link or text the word, connect the 25101 so you can get a little bit more information about us and so we can connect with you. Now, also because we believe in being family and because we are family, we always want to be there in your highs and lows. So if there's something that you want to, to pray about or if there's something that you want to celebrate, make sure you text the word CARE to 25101 because not only do we want to care for you and what God is doing through you, but we also want to look at maybe there's some needs that you may have. So if you have a need or if you want to meet a need, yes, we know we come out, we're coming out of Christmas, but we also know that there are some needs that still need to be met. So why don't you just text the word CARE to 25101. Now, you know, we are we are having church at home this Sunday, but next Sunday we are meeting live and in person at the Balcony Orlando. So if you want to join us in the place, because we want to see your face in the place, if you want to join us, make sure you text the word register to 25101 so you can have a seat. And we want you right here with us us. So, hey church, without further ado, we're going to just have a moment right now of giving and we're going to continue in with our service. So just pray with me as you prepare your gift. God, we love and we praise you, God. Thank you so much for us being a, permitted to be in your presence, God, to worship you in all the goodness of who you are. And so as we continue to worship you through our giving, God, please take what we have and just advance the kingdom of God, not just in our community locally, but abroad. So God, do what only you can do. We will be forever grateful and so thankful for who you are in our lives. God, we love you and we praise you. Amen. Hey church, let's continue to worship God and let's enjoy the rest of this service.
exactly like it says it. It says, in the days of his earthly life, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal sal salvation to all who obey him. The part that I want to emphasize today that really strikes me, I heard this once and um, I have never forgotten about this scripture since. It says that, and he was heard because of his reverence. Now we're talking about Jesus, the son of God, and it could easily say, and he was heard because he was the son of God, because he was God, the earth, like the earthly form. But it says that even Jesus was heard by the Father because of his reverence. And it strikes me of how this shows us and speaks of the power of reverence. And it makes me ask myself, it makes me wonder where, where is my reverence before the Lord? I know that when we are surrounded by circumstances, these circumstances can oftentimes become noise that just occupies so much space in our mind and in our hearts. And we come into these kinds of spaces or even at home, but we're trying to create a space of worship. And we just come with these just saturated minds and hearts. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes it's hard to focus. It's hard to hone in on Jesus. But I want us to really just search our hearts this morning. Is there reverence? Are we like approaching God? Are we approaching this space of worship? Are, are we approaching our hearts, which is the throne on which he sits with reverence, with this like understanding that the one that we worship is still seated on the throne, that the one that we worship is still worthy through it all, that the one that we worship is good, no matter like if our circumstances are good, if things turned out like we wanted or we hoped for, he's still good. Can we say he's good even when things are not good around us? Even when we feel like it's just so hard to stand firm and our foundation is being shaken. So let's approach this moment. Let's approach the throne of God with reverence. Let's look at him and just do so in awe of who he is and what he has done. We just sang about being grateful and let's sing with that gratitude and just understanding that there is power in the name of Jesus. Not because we are raising our voices, but because when we speak that name, there is a history of who he is, of who God has been. And that history that we read about in the Bible and we, we say that we believe it still stands. He's still the healer. He's still our salvation. He's still the Messiah. He's still Yahweh. Everything that we need, he is. And if we just can approach him with reverence, I believe that like Jesus, we will be heard. Amen. I don't want our, our worship to be like the sound of clanging cymbals. I want it to be a sweet melody in the ears of Jesus that will open up the heavens. And we can do that. The power rests on us, not because we have power, but because there is power in the name of Jesus. Do you believe that? Can we just agree all together to sing that, whether you are home or you are here, can we all just own that this morning and just approach this moment, approach Jesus, approach God with reverence, understanding that he is deserving of all honor, of all praise, of all worship. Can we do that together? I just invite you to just close your eyes, whether you are home or here, just close your eyes and just invite Jesus into your space to inhabit your worship, your heart. Let us repent from all sin, from straying away, from turning our back on him, and let us just approach him with reverence and declare that there is power in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Hey, church. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We're so, so glad that you're here. My hope and my prayer is that, that you've enjoyed your Christmas time. I pray that you spent some time with family and, and loved ones and friends and really, and really got a sense of what this season is really all about. We've been preaching about this idea that Emmanuel, that God is with us, and that is what we have been celebrating. And it's actually something that we don't have to wait till a, a calendar date in order to celebrate it, that the life of a follower of a Christ is that we constantly celebrate the fact that God is with us. That, that love is with us, that hope is with us, that salvation is with us, and that peace is with us. It's a great and exciting time. I, I truly do pray that you guys recognize that, that we are all here for a reason. I, tr- I don't believe in coincidences, which means that if you're watching this, it's because God has sent you here because he has something that he wants to speak to you. And I think the thing that determines what we get out of moments like this is our posture. So my prayer is this, that we can have a posture that allows us to really position ourselves to, to hear closely what God wants to speak to us. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and get those, grab a hold of those, take a note and write down some things that I believe that God may want to speak to us to encourage us in this season. You know, for many, this is going to be our last message of the year, depending on when you're engaging this content. This is our last message of the year, and and here's what that means. It's an opportunity for us to kind of evaluate, and as we know, there's a time for us to even begin to summarize what this year has been, and oh, what a year it has been. 2020. 2020. This, this, year of, this year of vision, this, this year of, of great ideas, I, I actually went back and I began to look at my journal in the beginning of 2020, just looking at some of the, the ideas, some of the vision, some of the dreams that, that God had placed on my heart. Looking at some of the messages that I preached in the beginning of the year, messages such as taking ground, believing that God was calling us to, to take our rightful place and, and advance the kingdom of God in our homes, advance the kingdom of God even in our personal walk and even in our community and globally, knowing that God is calling us to take ground and move forward and to build on momentum, these, these powerful thoughts and concepts that were meant to catapult us into a year of vision and opportunity. But as you know, March hits, and that's the year where, that's the time when, when the pandemic became a reality and, and the way that we did church radically shifted. It, it put a magnifying glass on so many things in our, in our culture, and it seemed as if everything came to a screeching halt. The ideas and the dreams and the visions that we may have had in, in the beginning of the year seemed as if they were all coming to an end. But oddly enough, as I take inventory of this year, and while it hasn't always been easy, and while there has certainly been its fair share of challenges, In its own unique way, I've seen how God has still been able to fulfill his vision through his people. This vision of wanting to not just be a a God that people gather inside of a building on a Sunday and worship, but even the thing that was on our hearts in the beginning of the year is taking Jesus home with us, making sure that, that Jesus was actually present in our homes. What better way to do that than for us to start having to participate in church at home as a result of us not being able to gather in a way that we're supposed to when we heard stories and testimonies about people who've prayed in their homes together with their families for the first time and we've seen marriages restored because it caused people to spend time together and actually pray and process together, they took ground. I've, I've heard stories of people that took ground even relationally in their community with us being able to do outreaches and reach the people of God in creative ways that we never had intended on doing. And quite honestly, we, want, we might not have done it had not been for the condition and the season that we found ourselves in. I'm a firm believer that we look at seasons like this and we can see Romans 8, 28 in action. The Bible says that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Please don't misunderstand it. I'm not saying that every situation is good, but God knows how to work every situation for his good. What I want us to understand and put into our hearts, that nothing is wasted when grace gets involved. And I think that sometimes for us, if we're honest with ourselves, we can look at this year and want to throw it away. I was looking at some of the hashtags and statements that people have made about 2020, and there are some emotions that I've shared. I've heard everything from throw away 2020, hi 2020, let's move on for 2020, wake me up when 2020 is over. And here, I understand all of that. But I think that the problem can be is that there's a lot of things that have happened in 2020 that God actually wanted to develop inside of us. There's a lot of things that God has shown us in 2020. And sometimes we could be in such a rush to get out of the season that we're in that we forget to bring the lessons that God wants us to utilize in the season that's to come. That's true, church. 
I believe that while this season has certainly been one that has been challenging and that has presented some levels of obstacles, that there is some wisdom that God wants us to bring with us into the next year. God works all things together for the good, that there's nothing wasted when grace is involved. But let's be real, it hasn't been easy. When talking with many in our community, I've asked the question of, how would you describe this year in one word or in a simple phrase? And, and some of the statements that I got back, they varied as much as the people that I talked to. Here, here's a couple of the ones I want to share with us today. One of the ones said it was a devastating year for them, a year of setback and, and challenges. Uh, another one told me that this was a year of challenges. It was a very challenging year for them. Other terms that were presented to me were, it's been a frustrating year. It's been a year of filled with disappointments. But, but, but however, there, there are other people that I've talked to, and some of them are the same people, have said that there's another thing that they've experienced as well. Others have said that, that this has actually oddly been a fruitful year for them, that it's been a very productive year for them. It's been a year of growth. It's been a year of really like dialing in and getting clarity on some things. Another one said that this is a year that has been very eye-opening. Now, that's something that I can relate to. In fact, I think if I were to put a theme around what I believe 2020 has been for me personally, I would certainly say that 2020 has probably been a year of revelation. So I guess it is a year of vision. And what I mean by that, it's revealed a lot about me that I probably didn't even know. And here's how you can say that this revelation came to pass. When the world is seemingly turned upside down and things begin to shake loose, you quickly are revealed to the things that are rooted in the kingdom and the things that are not. The things that, that, you, that you planted and put into people instead of being, being put into the person of Jesus Christ. And I believe that for all of us, that there's been some things that have been shaken out of our lives that have revealed to us that, man, this was rooted, this was rooted in the kingdom, but this may have been rooted in something that wasn't. And I believe that this is a year that presented opportunities for us to grow and to develop from it. But this last friend that I talked to, he used a phrase that I think perfectly encapsulates all of this stuff. He said that, that 2020 for him has been a year of tension. A year of tension. I really do agree with that. That bears witness in my spirit. Because here's the thing, it has had its challenges, but it's also had its moments of triumph. It's also had moments of success, and it's been a, a matter of being a year of tension. There's a passage in scripture, one of my favorite, I, I refer to it often, that really does a great job at presenting this tension that we all find ourselves living in from time to time. It's written by King Solomon, which he is documented as being the wisest man to ever walk on the face of the earth next to Jesus. And he shares with us in Ecclesiastes 3, again, one of my favorite passages of scripture to look to, to get understanding about times and seasons. And this is what it says, starting at verse number one, it says that there is an occasion for everything, a time for every activity under the sun, a time to give birth and a time to die. There's a tension there a time to plant and a time to uproot. There's, there's a tension that needs to be managed. There are a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up. There's a, there's a tension there, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to avoid embracing. Sounds a lot like the pandemic, a time to avoid from embracing. Okay, we'll move on from that. Okay, a time to search and a time to count as loss, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What this passage of scripture is doing is it's actually describing this idea of tension. I believe that that's, that's what my assignment is to talk to us today about, is recognizing that, that a lot of times that the things that we face are not problems exclusively to be solved, but they're tensions to be managed. Today, I want to talk to us about this idea of managing the tension. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for your people. God, I thank you that as challenging as it's been, Lord, you have brought us to the conclusion of 2020, and yet you still want to speak to us. So, Father, I just pray over the next few moments that you give us open eyes that we can see you, open ears that we can hear you, and open hearts to receive everything that you have for us. We give this time to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You know, tension, tension is best defined as being a state of being 
where things are stretched tight. It can cause discomfort. It can be a strained condition even at time. It's a moment where there's forces that are opposing one another. And here's the thing, there's an appropriate amount of tension. And when there's an appropriate amount of tension, that brings about balance. Because where there's no tension, there's extremes. And we know anything about extremes is that when there's extremes, we can lose balance. So life is really not about being extreme, it's about managing the tensions that we find ourselves in. Here's a couple of examples of the tensions that need to be managed for all of us. Many of us are familiar with the story of, of Mary and Martha, the sisters, in that moment where they're sitting and serving in the household with Jesus. We know that Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha is working, and there's this tension that's presented, this tension of being productive or having a posture of sitting at the feet of Jesus. Technically, neither one is wrong, but we have to manage that tension. We have to make sure that we're productive so that we can have an adequate posture of receiving from Jesus. But it's a tension to be managed. We have another tension that, that can happen in our society, the tension of ambition or contentment. Man, like we want to be people that are, that are filled with ambition, that are constantly looking for what's next, what's the next thing we can do. But, but we also don't want to become so extreme that we stop being content with where we are. The Bible talks about the importance of being content. So this tension to manage is recognizing that God has given us dreams and we have to have ambition, but simultaneously recognize we have to manage the tension of being content with what God has given us. Another tension to manage is this idea of strategy versus spirit. And what I mean by that is there are times that, that we want to be so strategic, so analytical, and so driven by, by data, which is super important. But then there's moments where the spirit of God is leading us to do something that maybe we haven't contrived a, a strategy for it yet. Either side can be extremes. We could be so spirit filled and spirit led that we have no practicality to implement it. Or we could be so practical, but there's no spirit in it. I think the beautiful image of this is in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible talks about how the earth was without form of void, but the spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. That means that God's presence was there and his spirit was there. That hovering means that his, his presence was, was, was emanating all over that environment, but things were out of order. So God began to put things in order or bring strategy or structure so that his spirit had a place to land. The same can be said about when he created man. The Bible says that he created man from the dust of the ground, but there was no life in him. That creation of man is strategy, but then the breath of God comes in and breathes on that strategy and it becomes a living soul. It's a tension to manage to make sure that we're not so strategic that we don't have place for the spirit, but we're not so spiritual that we don't have a place where we can still allow the spirit to land to cause reproduction. Another tension that we have to manage sometimes is assignment versus fulfillment. Man, that's a tough one because we know that God has ordered our steps and that we all have a, a, a divine assignment that he's given us. But it also talks about how God says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart that idea of being fulfilled, but there's a tension to be managed. Because if I go to the extreme of simply trying to do things that are looking for my fulfillment, that means that my feelings determine my peace and that I'm never content and I can find myself constantly moving on when I should learn to be at peace with my assignment. I think the tension to manage is recognizing my assignment and finding ways to be fulfilled even in that assignment and fulfillment, this idea of faith and works, this attention to be managed, this idea of knowing that, that I need to have faith, but I also need to put some work in, and the idea of knowing that I have to put my faith to work in order for me to adequately manage the tension, the tension of fight or flight. You can't fight about everything, but you can't run from everything, that there's a tension that needs to be managed. And where there is no tension, we find ourselves dealing with extremes. I want to shift into a narrative now that I believe beautifully highlights this idea of extremes and tensions, but how God still gets glorified through it. Ahab and Jezebel, they were extremes. If you look in the Bible about their story and, and 1 Kings starting around uh, chapter 16, we int we're introduced to these characters. And let me tell you something about them. The Bible says that, that, that they were more wicked than any other king that had come before them. Ahab was a king and he had led the people of God to worship Baal. He had led the people to, to worship the Asherah poles. In other words, to find resources beyond God. Hear what I'm saying. It wasn't that the people stumbled, stumbled upon it. it. It wasn't that the people found themselves compromising. No, they led them to a path 
to act contrary to the nature of God. And as a result of that, the Bible says that God was more angry at Ahab than he had ever been with anyone else. That's a, that's a heck of a thing to have on a resume, to be known as the individual that brought compromise and desolation into the hearts of God's people in such a way that they could not distinguish righteousness and truth anymore. They could not distinguish what was the will of God and what was the will of man anymore, that they were led to a place of being completely deceived and it broke the heart of God. But the beautiful thing about God is that he doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave us in this place because it gives birth to the ministry of a man that I wanna spend the rest of our time talking about. It gives birth to the ministry of this man named Elijah. Now, Elijah, he was a man who was well acquainted with tension, that he was a miracle working prophet and he burst on a scene in 1 Kings 17. We don't hear anything about him or know anything about him prior to that. His life is profoundly impactful. He became the model of what does it mean to be a passionate follower of God who was willing to, to go up against culture and face, and face insurmountable odds for the benefit of the kingdom of God. This is what Elijah's life was marked by, but we can't help but to notice that his life and his ministry was birthed out of necessity that he had this tension that needed to be resolved because the world that he lived in was so wicked, it was so broken that it activated something on the inside of him that compelled him to step into a space that allowed him to fulfill what he was ultimately called to do. See, I believe that this year is a year where we've had to navigate and manage tensions. And as I said earlier, we're not careful. We'll, we'll want to quickly escape this year, but, but miss the wisdom and the things that God has done through us in it. And I believe if we can look at the highlight reels of, of Elijah's life, that we can probably extract some things that, that he was able to do as a result of the tensions that he managed, that I think we can take with us into 2021. I want you to write these things down because I think it can be encouraging for you. Here's the first thing I want you to write down. That tension activates calling. That tension it can sometimes activate calling. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse number one, it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from the Gilead settlers said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, in whose presence I stand, there will be no dew or rain during these years except at my command. Catch that for a moment. That, that, that Elijah after seeing the broken condition, that Elijah, after seeing that, that Ahab, that after seeing Jezebel, that after they led the people of God to worship resources and people and things and getting a vision of how their life could be fulfilled beyond God, that he steps into their home. Imagine the boldness of him stepping into their court and saying, as the Lord God lives, that we're gonna shut up. We're gonna shut the heavens up and there will be no more rain until I say so. You see, for Elijah, I wonder, I wonder what his life would have looked like or what his calling would have looked like if, if Ahab and Jezebel weren't so terrible. But, but somehow, as a result of the life that they were living and the way they were leading God's people, it activated something on the inside of him that compelled him to speak up, that compelled him to get involved, that compelled him to recognize that I need to bring balance to the craziness that we see in this world. What an amazing thing that, that, that Elijah, that not only did he cause there to be no more rain for the next three years to truly show that God was the sustainer and provider of all life, that he also like single-handedly took down the false prophets, that this man provided some of the most incredible miracles in the Old Testament, and it was all birthed out of famine. It was all birthed out of tension. Imagine his life if that tension and those problems weren't there. I believe that seasons of tension can sometimes activate calling and purpose. For some of us this year, it has activated passions and convictions inside of us that we didn't even know that we had. As a result of the world that we find ourselves in, that people have been speaking up and being passionate about topics that they never knew were near and dear to their heart. But as a result of being faced with a world that seemed to be accepting of things that are so contrary to the nature and kingdom of God that has caused people to step up and say, I need to give my voice to this. 
I've seen people that have, that have, their eyes have been opened up and they know that God has called them to be the solution to a problem. And so they're stepping into it by launching a business. I've seen people that have recognized some of the discrepancies that they see in society. And so God is leading them to go back to school so they can get the education to be a part of the solution. I've seen people who have become more vocal and about racism and being an anti-racist than they ever have in their life because somehow this season has opened their eyes to something that they knew that they needed to give their voice to. I know that sometimes we want to move quickly on from the pain that we endure, but don't forget to bring the lesson and the wisdom of the fact that God will activate something in seasons like this. That moments of tension can often give birth to ideas and, and, and anointing that we didn't even know that was inside of us. That, that sometimes the tension and the pressing is necessary in order for us to tap into the calling that's on the inside of us. That, that tension can sometimes activate our calling. But there's another thing that can happen as a result of the tensions that we find ourselves in. That tensions, it, revol it, it reveals our vulnerabilities. And man, do we have some vulnerabilities. When we, when we look at the world that we're living in right now, if I think that 2020 has done anything, it, is, it has revealed just how vulnerable we all are, how vulnerable some of our relationships are how vulnerable some of our financial situations are that, that when things get tweaked and we're not able to function the way that, that we're used to functioning, it reveals just how vulnerable we are. It even reveals just how vulnerable some of our relationships are. I'm speaking of instances where as a result of this climate that we live in, there are people that are like, man, like, man, me and this individual, we're really close friends until someone openly sides with a political candidate. And then it reveals just how vulnerable that friendship is because now that I know that you support this person, then that means you think this way and now it makes me question whether or not we can be friends. It's, it's revealing just how vulnerable our friendships are. It, it, it reveals how vulnerable even our resources are. Man, that there's some time when you didn't even have to think about finances because you had such a job that, that seemed to be so stable that there was no possibility there could ever be anything that disrupts it but then when we find ourselves in a season where we can't gather the way that we used to, we can't do what we used to do, that you now realize that now that I may not be defined as an essential worker. I may not be defined as a person whose, whose role is pertinent and how is that gonna affect me and it's revealed just how vulnerable we are. It's even revealed how vulnerable the church is. I'm not talking about the Kingdom of God, capital C Church, I'm talking about the local church. The local church that has, for years, that has, has benefited from people gathering together, lifting up the name of Jesus in community together. But the moment that that was hit, it caused us to, to scatter, to scramble, to do our best to try to tighten our community. And it reveals to us that we were strong when we're together. But what happens when we are, we are forced to scatter, even as they were in the early church, it reveals just how vulnerable we are. You see, for Elijah... This man who was filled with such boldness and such conviction and whose calling was activated as a result of this tension, he was also a man who had some vulnerabilities. First Kings 19, verse number one, it says that Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done. And everything that Elijah had done was he defeated the prophets. He allowed it to stop raining through the word that God had given him that Elijah was very effective. Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, may the gods punish me and do ever so severely if I don't make your life like one of the ones that you've killed by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there. But he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He sat down under a broom tree and prayed that he might die. Watch these words. He said, I have had enough. I have had enough. And I know that there have been times where I've, I've been tempted to, to utter out those very same words. Man, I have had enough. And this is what Elijah says. He said, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my ancestors. He says, I have, I have nothing else to give. Think about this for a moment. After successfully defeating these false prophets, Elijah is made aware that Jezebel has issued a death sentence on him and he is completely deflated. He flees into the wilderness. He sits under a tree and he literally begs for death. This is a far cry 
from the man who boldly walked into the king's court and uttered the words of God with such conviction. This is a far cry from the man that, that God had given this, this vision of being a person who can make impact. This is a far cry from the man that was able to do some incredible miracles, such as feeding and even bringing people back to life. This is a far cry from a man whose ministry was activated as a result of tension. But when he faces resistance in the form of a death threat, he runs for his life and it revealed just how vulnerable he really was. Elijah was no longer in control and it exposed a fear for him that many of us has. When he realized that things were out of control, it revealed a vulnerability that he didn't even know existed. And I suspect for some of us that this season has revealed a vulnerability that we didn't even know existed. Things that we thought were strong, things that we thought were stable, things that we thought were secure, that has revealed a, a fear. It's revealed a concern. It's revealed a, a burden. It's revealed areas where we've gotten to a point where we feel exhausted and deflated in the same way that Elijah did. However, I want to encourage us with something, that where there is tension, there is growth. Where there is resistance, there is development. It doesn't always feel good, but it can certainly lead to some great things. The thing about tests is they reveal where we're strong, but it also reveals the areas that we need to send reinforcement. It reveals the area that we need to get some strength. It reveals the areas that we know that we're still vulnerable. Here's the thing about vulnerability. Vulnerability, it should lead to humility, and then humility should lead us to stability. And this is how we get stable. Sometimes the best way to get stability into your life is to simply lower your center of gravity. I'm talking about when we get into a posture of praying, it allows us to lower our center of gravity so that as things are shaking. We don't lose our balance so easily because we find ourselves rooted in the things of God. I believe that this season has brought us to a place where we recognize our vulnerability, but it also produced humility that has put us in a place where I'm now on my knees. I'm lowering my center of gravity and I'm allowing myself to get in a posture where I can hear and receive and trust in the person and presence of God. Please understand that this may be a season that there's been some vulnerability that's been exposed, but it gives birth to humility and God is bringing stability to it because God knows how to send you resources. He knows how to send you support. When Elijah was sitting under that tree, the angel of the Lord came before him and said, it's time for you to get up. It's time for you to get something to eat. It's time for you to drink because God is not done with you yet. I'm not sure who I'm talking to right now. So let me say it to this camera right here. God is not done with you yet. That you may be feeling like you're sitting under a tree and you may be saying like Elijah, I can't take it anymore. I can't deal with this anymore. I need to move on. This is not something that I signed up for. But the angel of the Lord brought a message to Elijah and says, man, you need to eat something. You need to begin to nourish yourself on the word of God. Don't allow yourself to get nourishing on fear. Don't nourish yourself on doubt. Don't nourish yourself on the anxiety. But you begin to nourish yourself on the word of God and allow the water of the word to be the thing that washes over you because God is not done with you yet. I'm talking to somebody right now and you feel like giving up. You feel like giving in that 2020 has brought hell to your doors. But I want to let you know that heaven is on the inside of you and God is not done with you yet. Don't you dare give up. Don't you dare give in. God is not done with you yet. You may see some areas where you're vulnerable, but God is sending reinforcements to you. He is not done with you yet. God's not done with you yet. That we may recognize that we are vulnerable, but there are some reinforcements that are coming your way and that God knows how to meet you exactly where you are. Here's the third and final thing that I think that this season has produced in some of us as it relates to tension. Tension brings us closer to God. Tension, it can bring us closer to God. First Kings 19, verse number nine. He, being Elijah, he entered the cave there and spent the night. Suddenly, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah was in a cave, he was hiding. And God speaks to him and he asks him his, this question. What are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Because here is not the place that I need you. There's a, there's a there that I'm trying to send you to. What are you doing here? He tells Elijah to get up and to go and stand in his presence. What a beautiful image. That as this man is fearful, deflated, lacking direction, exhausted, ready to give in that God speaks to him and he says to him, what I need you to do, your next step is I need you to get up and I need you to stand 
in my presence. This is where that powerful story is told of how God appears and gives him this image of wind blowing. And it says that God wasn't in the wind of the earth shaking and God wasn't in the earthquake that a fire coming and God wasn't in the fire and mountains moving and God wasn't in that. In other words, everything that I just described are the ways that God appeared before Moses when they were in the wilderness. He was saying a message that Elijah, the way that I interacted with Moses is not the way that I'm going to interact with you, that I'm actually going to deal with you a little bit differently. I'm going to do a new thing in you without even knowing it, that he was actually reconciling comparison that we all can struggle with. Because for some of us, we're like, man, like that individual, man, like, man, they, they pray fire down. And God's like, I'm not asking you to do that. That's not how I'm going to deal with you. But he says that, Elijah, I'm going to speak to you in a still, small voice. That still, small voice is a reflection of, I'm whispering. You can hear me because I'm so close to you. See, this season where Elijah was acting on behalf of God, where Elijah had done some incredible things on behalf of God, was now at a place where he was drawing closer to God and he could actually hear the whisper, the still small voice of God. I realize that this season has presented opportunities for it to activate calling for us. I realize that this season has been also one that's revealed vulnerabilities, but I believe that this season has also been one that's been creating opportunities for us to see just how close God is to us. God knows how to provide. I've talked with many in our community, some of you that are watching right now that have lost your job, but yet God has provided. I'm talking to many in our community right now that have lost their friends, but yet God has provided what they needed. It's amazing how in these seasons of of intense tension that pushes us beyond our comfort zone, that the things that are not rooted in the kingdom, the things that kind of get shaken out, the things that, that we no longer have a hold of, that God makes sure there's no lack. He knows exactly how to meet us where we are. And it's the testimony that comes from that that reveals to us that God truly is with me. I believe that moments of tension, they actually reveal to us just how close God is. And my hope is that as we conclude this year and we consider the journey we've been on, everything that we've endured, what we've walked through up to this point, that we don't lose the wisdom and the experiences that we've got from 2020 that the truth of the matter is this, is that God has been with us the entire time. It's been tension, but that tension has activated calling and passion and opened our eyes to things that we didn't even know was there. That tension has revealed vulnerabilities, but God knew how to cover those vulnerabilities and send us resources. But it's also shown us just how close God is. God will never leave you nor forsake you. And if you're listening to this, that's evidence that you have survived. That's evidence that God is with you. The enemy has hit you with his best shot and you are still here. That means that God is not done with you yet. On these two occasions, when God is speaking to Elijah, he says to him, what are you doing here? He says it to him twice. I think the point is that he recognized that for all of us, we must evaluate where we are so that we can set the journey for where we're called to go. And I believe that God is calling all of us to take a step forward, that God is calling all of us to move forward, that God gives Elijah instructions to go and anoint three people. He tells him how to move forward. This is who I'm talking to right now, that God is not done with you yet. He's asking, what are you doing here? Because there's a there that I need you to go to. I'm going to give you some instructions. There are some next steps for you. There are some things and some people that I need you to interact with. There's some, there's some people that I need you to pray for. There's some people that I need you to develop. There's some people that I'm calling you to still impact. What are you doing here? Because there's a next step that God's desire for all of us is to move forward. As we go into this new year, my hope and my prayer can be that we recognize that God is not done with me yet. I survived 2020 and there's wisdom and experiences I'm bringing with me. And I'm going to take that into my next assignment as God is calling me to go into this next year. I'm not sure who I'm talking to right now, but maybe your testimony is similar to that of Elijah. Lord, I've had enough. I'm done. I I don't even, I don't even know what to do. I want you to pause. I want you to breathe. I want you to posture yourself in a way that you can hear from God and recognize he is not done with you yet. Manage the tension. There's been some, some challenges that we've faced but God has birthed calling and passions inside of us. He's revealed vulnerabilities, but he's sending reinforcements. 
and he is still close to us and he's not done with us just yet. Wherever you are, God is not done with you yet. Let me pray for us. Lord, I'm so thankful that you are not done with us yet, that your word declares that you will never leave us nor forsake us and that we have calling and purpose and destiny for our lives. And while this year may be of one that has been wrecked with challenges and oppositions and frustrations and disappointment, there's also been the tension of recognizing that you've activated something on the inside of us, that you revealed to us the areas that we need to lean on you more, and God, that you are right next to us the entire time. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for our community, that every vulnerability that has been exposed to us, God, that we lower our center of gravity, that we pray, that we seek your face, we humble ourselves, God, so that we can experience the stability that you have for us. Lord, I pray for our community. I pray for our peace of mind. I pray for our hearts, Lord, that we can posture ourselves in such a way that we can experience everything that you have for us. You are not done with us yet. That 2020 was rough, but it wasn't a waste. That nothing is wasted when grace is involved. And we believe that you're going to redeem and work all things together for the good. We're going to take the wins with us into 2021, the wisdom and everything that you shared with us, knowing that it's going to help us to help others. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. I love you. I cannot wait to worship with you next week where we're actually going to be doing part two of this message once Elijah moves on and what God had called him to do. I can't wait to see you then. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. I'll see you next week.